This is a recording on proteins and enzymes, and I cannot stress really how important enzymes in particular are, and enzymes are made of proteins in cells, because life itself would not exist or be able to uh, live the way it does without the ability to make reactions happen that otherwise would have happened so slowly, and the probability of them having, happening quick enough is so low that enzymes come in and speed the process up. And we call uh, something that speeds uh, a reaction up a catalyst. And that is how we spell it, catalyst. And the definition of a catalyst is something that speeds up a reaction which is not actually affected by the reaction itself. And here we have a classic enzyme reaction. And this consists of, and these are all keywords, uh, an active site into which a substrate fits. Now, there's two types of reaction that could occur with an enzyme. Um, and if I was to insert a diagram here, uh, you can see here that we have two types. OK, so if we draw a line here, this is number one, and this is number two. And number one involves a substrate which is going to be broken down into two separate things. So uh, the chemical comes into here, into the active site, and the active site changes it. Uh, you don't really need to know how it does that, but it lowers the activation energy. And this act low lowered activation energy enables these two products to be formed. So we have substrate going into enzyme at the active site, keyword substrate, keyword active site. We have products as a keyword. And here we have something that is broken down. A classic example of this might be in digestion. Uh, and we know very well that the definition of digestion is the breakdown of large insoluble food molecules into smaller soluble ones that can be absorbed into the blood and therefore be taken to the cells uh, involving, uh, involved in energy and growth and movement and the cell processes. So this number one here is when something is broken down. Number two is when something is formed and this is called synthesis and we can actually see de degradation is breaking down. Uh, synthesis is when we make something and this is an example where two substrates come in to the active site again, not labelled here, but this is the active site here. And they come in, and as a result of them being brought together, a bit like a dating agency, they are able to be hooked up and form a product in which they are both together. And so they have been made, there has been synthesis. Uh, now, a perfect example of this would be uh, something like photosynthesis, where we have Uh, as we know, we have uh, a scenario where the carbon dioxide and water come into the uh, chloroplast and are converted into glucose plus oxygen. And uh, if I can just work out here how to move us down. You can write that as it's uh, 6H2O plus 6CO2 goes to C6H12O6 plus 6O2. And you can see here that H2O and CO2 are quite simple molecules and they've been turned into glucose, which is C6H12O6. And so that's been built up. That's been a synthesis reaction. And if uh, I always talk about um, respiration, actually, let's change the colour here. Uh, I always talk about respiration, but if we were to uh, change that round, C6H12O6 plus 6O2 goes to 6H2O plus 6CO2. This obviously reverse process is respiration. And 
What you can say here, guys, is that we've learned these two equations. What you can say is that right in the middle here, and let's make them a nice pinky colour, here and here, in this arrow, what this arrow represents are loads and loads of enzyme reactions. There's, it's not, it doesn't just happen. The enzymes allow these, in photosynthesis, water and carbon dioxide to come together to form glucose plus oxygen. And in respiration, it allows the breakdown of the glucose into water and carbon dioxide by loads and loads of enzyme reactions. And this cannot be underestimated. And you know this is true, because if we take respiration, here, it's looking at respiration, you know that if you were to leave a sugar bowl with sugar in on your kitchen table, you know that it does not spontaneously turn into water and CO2. It just doesn't happen. In fact, you could leave it there for a million years and it wouldn't happen. So something must be at work here. And that is these little fellas here. And if you added enzymes here and you gave it the right conditions, you would actually turn that sugar into carbon dioxide and water. So what are those right conditions? Well, we can link this actually very clearly to a process that happens in the body called homeostasis. Now, so much of our syllabus cross links, but homeostasis is keeping the internal conditions of the body constant. Okay, homeo means same and stasis is condition or um, state. And it's important that this happens because enzymes are very, very sensitive to two major things that we need to know about. The first is temperature, and the second is pH. And in order to work out why they are so sensitive to these, we need to go into just a little more detail about why enzymes work the way they do. And so if we were to uh, take another picture, Let's just go our basic enzyme substrate diagram. We can see here that the substrate fits beautifully into the active site. And it is no coincidence that these have been drawn so precisely here so that they seem to be a good fit. And the way that we describe this is the lock and key hypothesis. Now, you know from your experience that if you have a key that doesn't quite fit a lock, it might go in, but it will not turn that lock and you cannot open a door. And it's very similar with enzymes and substrates. If we were to try and roughly copy that there, and I was to have an enzyme, which just say, had a bit of a thing there and then went down nicely there and then went down there. Sad, sorry, had a substrate. Can you see this part, this part here doesn't fit. And so this is all not quite nice here and here, but this area doesn't allow a perfect fit. And so this would not work. There would not be a reaction here. And the way that we describe this is an absolutely crucial, crucial phrase. And it is that substrate active site reactions depend completely on shape. They are shape specific, like a lock and a key. And it's always good to remember 
But if that is the case, and a shape changes, then the enzyme's ability to do its job is going to change. And that brings us back to temperature and pH. Because together, these are both going to change shape in the active site. And if you change the shape of the active site, you no longer have the ability for the substrate to bind, and that enzyme will not work. Okay, so how does this happen? Well, if we take uh, our, let's just do a basic enzyme active site with a basic substrate. Okay. And that fits in perfectly. Now let's say that we were to raise the temperature. Now, we, sh we have to know that temperature, in fact, is usually a friend of the enzyme. And that comes back to our chemistry, in which we talk about rate of reaction changing with temperature. Now, normally, it's important to remember that normally, this reaction of substrate going into the enzyme would happen by sheer chance. And the reason that this can work is that there are a number of substrates all around. And when I say a number, guess how many? If you're talking about, say, in a cell or a reaction, well, not that many, about 200 billion, okay? And the enzymes, guess how many enzymes there are? Well, I'll tell you what, it's not that number. It's about 200 billion. And these guys are moving all over the shop, okay? Uh, and they're doing it because they've got kinetic energy, okay? And everyone is moving around, mingling at this big party, and some S's are hitting S's, and some S's are hitting the edge at the top of the enzyme molecule, and some S's are hitting the bottom. But guess what? Some S's are hitting the active site. And it is random. It is chance. But if you put enough enzyme molecules together with enough substrates, you're going to be able to get a reaction. Now, if these guys are in a low temperature, there is actually no problem with the shape of the enzyme and the substrate. It's just that they're moving so slowly that the chances of a substrate going into the active site are much smaller over a period of time. So the reaction doesn't happen very fast. As we start speeding Sorry, as we start increasing the temperature, we start speeding them up. They've got more kinetic energy and suddenly we have more collisions. OK, and this is good because the more random collisions of all these things mean that we're going to have more and more of the substrates hitting active sites and creating a reaction. OK, and it's important to remember that the reactions happen again and again and again. Once a substrate has gone into an active site and the reaction's happened, the active site is then free once the products have been released to take another substrate. So if we increase the temperature, we increase the uh, active site and substrate reactions and it's bing, bang, 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 bang. And it's really quite nice. And if we were to draw a graph of this, where we had enzyme activity, and temperature, we would actually see that it would go up quite nicely. As the temperature increases, so does the enzyme activity. But, B-U-T, there is a but. And it's this, if we take an enzyme 
with a very specific active site like this and we increase the temperature too much this protein molecule because remember an enzyme is still a protein is made of many 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 amino acids and they are all together in a specific shape and as you know the shape of the active site is crucial for a reaction to happen all of these molecules within this protein are actually ever so gently depending on the temperature they've all got kinetic energy and they're vibrating in fact every atom in the world that's above absolute zero which is everything is vibrating it's vibrating just very very gently okay like a little jig if you increase the temperature too much they start vibrating harder and harder and a bit like an earthquake where a building will fall down once it gets to a certain level because the vibrations are just so great that it falls to pieces we start to get a situation where if the temperature goes too high the vibrations are going to change the shape of the active site so imagine if these vibrations were to actually change the active shape shape like that if we have a substrate it now doesn't fit perfectly and that reaction will not happen and so what happens is when we get to a critical temperature here we see back to the graph that the activity drops dramatically and that is because the substrates are no longer fitting the active sites and we call this process and it's hugely important denaturing an enzyme is said to be denatured if its active site has irreversibly changed shape it won't go back and it no longer works the substrate no longer fits the active site can you see how all these keywords are coming in so we need to know that increasing the temperature is good yay to a certain extent but boo once we get to a certain temperature which is too high and causes the enzyme to denature now there's one other thing to say and that is let me change color here this point let me use green for this one because it's pretty good this point here where there is the maximum activity is called the enzymes optimum okay optimum means best so the optimum temperature would be that one there okay and in our human bodies this tends to be about 37 degrees C and lo and behold our cells are kept by homeostasis and thermoregulation which is the regulation of your temperature at about 37 degrees C if you get a fever and your body overheats you enter this zone and your enzymes will start changing shape they no longer can do the processes the activities they're meant to do and you're in trouble and I only have to scroll back up to all this shambles to show you this reaction respiration is the way that you get energy and if the enzymes here are no longer able to do their work because you've got a fever and you're overheating uh, then you die because you can't get any energy and so this is why fevers are so dangerous and why your body also works very hard to try and thermoregulate to keep this temperature the same so that is temperature now what about pH because this is the, the next one that we need to know about and once again it all comes down to shape and if I was to go into a little more detail with our enzyme that we just looked at with its specific active site we actually would be able to notice that at the level of but let me just show you the way that uh, 
protein might look. Okay, this is the way that a protein looks. It's got, these are all amino acids. And this actually cross-references back. This is an amino acid, and this is an amino acid. And this cross-references back to digestion, actually, because you know that digestion is the breakdown of large insoluble molecules into smaller soluble ones. Um, and we break down proteins into amino acids. And these are examples of all the amino acids. There's about 20 that we use in our body. You don't need to know them. Um, I think that's acinine, is it? And that's glycine, phenylalanine, glutamine. Anyway, now, all of these can be broken up by digestion into their individual amino acids, which can be absorbed into the blood. And the way that a protein that is all linked up like this looks will actually depend upon the way that the individual pluses and minus charges in the molecules are. So uh, actually let's um, insert, let's see if we can just go to a diagram here. Um, let me show you the shape of the way that an enzyme really looks in real life. Okay. Um, okay, here it is. This is the actual way that a protein looks. Can you see the bizarre, twisty, turning shape of it? And the reason that it looks like this is that all over it, we say it's bristling with charge. And that is, each amino acid has pluses and minuses on it. And if we go back to our, our diagram here, the shape of a protein, just a bit like the one I just showed you, will be because all over it will be plus Plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus, plus, plus. And in fact, you can see the way it would, it would actually take a shape as a result of attractions and repulsions. So, for example, you might have a plus there and a minus there because they are repelling each other. But when you have something that's pulled together close, uh, for example, here, you might have, sorry, you'd have plus, plus there because they're repelling each other. Very good, Mr. Abraham, getting that basic thing wrong. Um, but here might be minus, minus. Can you see where they've been pulled together? And so the shape of a protein, and therefore, in fact, an enzyme active site, is very specific as a result of the pluses and minuses and the way they fit together. A bit like magnets, a bit like you've got a whole thing of geomag and put it together, it would form a certain shape according to the attractions and repulsions of the magnets. Now, this is crucial. Because if we go back to our enzyme with an active site, we can actually now, using this, know that this whole protein is going to be bristling with charge. There's charges all over it. And they will, these will be very specific, creating a certain shape. Okay. And our substrate is going to fit into that beautifully. Now, what happens if I add acid? And this goes to our chemistry. And what we need to know is that acid is H plus ions. And H plus ions are protons. They are pluses. So if I put H plus... H plus, H plus, H plus, H plus, H plus, in a solution all around this, and I've increased the acidity. Acid means more hydrogen ions. Then can you see that the minus
minuses are going to be pulled towards the pluses because they're attracted. And the pluses are going to be repelled away from it. And this is going to do something to our enzyme. And this is just pretty basic now. If we look at this, we draw our enzyme again. Okay. If we look at those pluses up here being repelled, it's going to draw, pull them in. Those minuses up here are going to be attracted. And just from our basic outline up there, we've got a situation where the H pluses are here. Our active site has changed shape. Our substrate is here. That no longer fits. And so the substrate will not fit the active site and therefore the rate of reaction will go down. If we were to draw a graph of enzyme activity and pH, the way it would work would be dependent upon which pH the enzyme liked best. And the way we can cross-reference this actually is in digestion. And in digestion, if we were to have, say, maybe um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In digestion, we have an enzyme that actually really likes about pH two and then comes down and then enzymes that really like around pH 7. And that mirrors the stomach, which and the enzyme is pepsin, which really likes uh, acidic conditions. And we know that the stomach is acidic because it secretes HCl, hydrochloric acid. And in the small intestine and the mouth, we have more alkaline conditions. So this would be amylase in the mouth and pancreatic that's meant to be current pancreatic, my pen's not working very well. Uh, let's get rid of that. Anyway, pancreatic uh, lipase and protease and pancreatic amylase as well. And they prefer pHs which are more neutral, around 7.2, I believe. Okay, so the last two things to say about pH are that unlike temperature, when the temperature gets too high, an enzyme denatures because the active site irreversibly changes shape. But with pH, the things we need to remember are it's not about high or low. It's about how H plus ions affect the active site and whether they change the shape. In pepsin, in the stomach, H plus ions do not change the shape of the active site. And if, but if you added these uh, pancreatic enzymes to the stomach, the high acidity would change their active site, uh, site shape. And likewise, if you put pepsin in the small intestine where it was more neutral, that would change its active site. So remember with pH, it's not about high or low, it's just about optimum. Okay, remember that word optimum, which is the optimum pH. And the last thing to say about pH is that this enzyme where the active site has changed here has not actually been denatured. It has changed shape but it's not irreversible. If we were to put it back in its conditions and for example if you take away these H plus ions then the active site would is capable of going back to the right shape and the substrate is capable of fitting in. Okay. So that is a summary of enzymes. They're made of proteins which are made of amino acids. 
They are hugely important to every cellular function because they allow reactions that would have happened very, very slowly to happen much more quickly. And it is important to remember that enzymes don't make reactions happen that wouldn't have happened. They just make them go a billion, billion times quicker so that they actually could happen. OK. And they do that by lowering the activation energy. And I'm going to give you one last graph. And that is the energy required for a reaction to usually take place. Let's say uh, the enzyme reaction might need to get to that energy level before it happens. And so it's got to go all the way up there. OK, and usually and we can see this uh, quite clearly if we burn something, you might add that energy by adding heat. OK, uh, but we need our enzyme reactions to take place at 37 degrees, which is all the way down here. see. And the way that an enzyme works is it enables this reaction to take place at that energy level. So if you've got 100 billion molecules all colliding, it might be only a very small level that get to this energy level that react. But if you only need this energy level, you've suddenly got loads more. And that's why the reaction happens so much quicker. OK, we call this point here. This point here, the activation energy. Uh, that with the normal reaction, and this is a lower activation energy. That pen is rubbish. Okay, so that is enzymes done.